Chapter 67 The Jubilee, Part 1, Leviticus 25, 8-17 And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee ye shall return every man unto his possession. And if thou sell aught unto thy neighbour, or buyest aught of thy neighbour's hand, ye shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee thou shalt buy of thy neighbour, and according unto the number of years of the fruits he shall sell unto thee, According to the multitude of years thou shalt increase the price thereof, and according to the fewness of years thou shalt diminish the price of it, for according to the number of the years of the fruits doth he sell unto thee. Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 25, 8-17 The Jubilee makes it very plain that the economics of God's law is sharply different from all other economic systems. After seven sevens of years and seven sabbatical years, the Jubilee, another Sabbath year, is celebrated. This means two Sabbath years in a row, a fact referred to in 2 Kings 19.29 and Isaiah 37.30. The Jubilee is also cited in Deuteronomy 15, 1-18 and 31 9 to 13. It is present even more, perhaps, in the New Testament. Our Lord cites the Jubilee proclamation of Isaiah 61, 1 to 6, that is, verse 1 and part of verse 2 thereof, and then declares, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Luke 4, 16 to 21. His coming marks the beginning of God's greater Jubilee. In the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes echo the Jubilee Law and Isaiah 61, one following. The Lord's Prayer is a Jubilee prayer and a petition. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, Matthew 6.12, is an aspect of the Jubilee Law. The Jubilee Law has some key provisions. First, all rural property was to be returned to the original owner or his family. Seals were thus leases for the number of years to the next jubilee. Urban properties could be sold permanently, but not rural properties. Because God is the owner of the earth, Psalm 24.1, etc., God dictates the terms of men's possession thereof. Second, Hebrew slaves or bond servants could not be held for more than six years. The seventh year was the year of release. The Jubilee not only celebrates their freedom, but also their return to their original home. God, as the Goel, or next of kin, is a redeemer of these covenant peoples from their financial bondage. Third, all debts were cancelled in the Sabbath years, and also by the Jubilee. By combining this cancellation with the return to the land and to one's family, the meaning of the release is intensified. Fourth, the land is allowed to lie fallow, and its volunteer crops are for the use of all. It is now known that fallowed land increases its productivity thereafter. It is renewed. Fifth, the jubilee year began on the Day of Atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, Tishri, which is September to October, and was thus inaugurated by atonement. Sixth, the great emphasis of the Jubilee was on liberation. 
proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Verse 10. This verse has had a long history in Western civilization as a hope and faith. The Hebrew word for liberty is juror, running free, finding oneself in a happy flow of freedom. The doctrine of land ownership set forth was firmly established among the people as the case of Naboth made clear, 1 Kings 21, 8 following. The indictment of Micah 2.2 is concerned with violations of the land law. Grant said of this land law, It is the yielding up the right of property every seventh year the Israelites owned from whom he held it. For that year he was not proprietor. The harvest belonged to anyone as much as to him, and it was expressly as a Sabbath to Jehovah that this was appointed. That year Jehovah entertained all freely with that which sprang up under his hand apart from human cultivation. It was upon this recognition of the divine lordship Israel's tenure of it all depended. For the violation of this command, the land was to enjoy its Sabbaths that had been wrested from it, lying vacant while the people were cast forth. Chapters 25-35 and this clearly gives meaning to the jubilee restoration. Moreover, in this parable of the husbandmen, the Lord expressly connects their rejection of himself with the rejection of Jehovah's rights over the vineyard which he let out to them. Here, the idea conveyed in the sabbatical year is extended and developed, Matthew 21, 33-41. The prophets had been his servants sent to receive his fruits. Afterward he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. Hence comes the righteous sentence upon them. The great jubilee of God comes with the new creation. It is called by Peter. The times of the restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 3.21 The doctrine of restitution is basic to the Jubilee and to the biblical doctrine of liberty. No study has been made of the application and use of this law in Christendom. It is worthy of note at any rate that An Armenian code of the 12th century put some bits of the Jubilee law into practice. The rule that urban property could be redeemed only within one year after it was sold, while property outside city walls was subject to redemption for seven years, a very considerable modification. One aspect of the Jubilee which must be noted is the requirements of family reunions, that is, of covenant members. It is an error to stress simply the economic aspects of this law. For God's law, economics and the family are essentially tied. The purpose of economic activity is to further the life of the family. Knight is thoroughly right in seeing this law as a strong correction to the view that Scripture's message is the redemption of individual men who are called to be born again. It is that and much more. First, The covenant family rests and comes together to be renewed in their love and their faith. Second, the land, by its jubilee rest, is also renewed or born again. The jubilee law also makes it clear that inheritance is not a personal and individualistic fact. It is religious and looks to the transmission of land and other forms of wealth to generations yet to come. No man can view himself as anything but a trustee under God of whatever he possesses. The law of the Jubilee thus makes it clear that economics is an aspect of family life and together with the family is a part of our life in the Lord in terms of his law. Henry George was greatly influenced by the Jubilee law, although his use of it was a humanistic revision. In Ruth 4, we see an aspect of the family duties required by this law. 
Modern man has created false divisions in his life by needlessly isolating its spheres. The unity of things is imposed from above by the state's controls which intervene in the family, economics, inheritance, educations, and all things else. This is a false unity and a destructive one. In the biblical faith and law, the unity is under God and the locale on earth is the family. Humanism leads to false and totalitarian emphases. Those to whom economics is the key insist on an economic or free market perspective on everything and some Randians give prostitution as a free market activity equal status with the family. Others, by seeing the state as the unifying agent, give us various forms of socialism. The Jubilee most certainly deals with economic facts, but its perspective is theological, as economics must be. The Declaration, Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God, verse 17, is a religious statement governing an economic fact. Christ's coming is a Jubilee fact, because it declares that both restitution and liberty are basic to his kingdom, together with a victorious rest. Romans 8, 19 following celebrates the great jubilee at the end of history, and our Lord speaks of it in Matthew 19, 27-30, and 25-34, as does 1 Peter 1, 4. The law of the jubilee tells us that both time and and eternity results in victory 